So, good morning, everybody. Thank you for a nice, uh, very nice introduction. Thank you for the opportunity of being here in Monterrey. Mexico is my first time in Mexico, and I really like it, especially the mountains around Monterrey are beautiful. <coughs> It's a great honor to be a keynote speaker on this conference. I can see more than 200 people here in the audience. As far as uh, I know, there are also more than 300 people who subscribed online. So hello, the online audience, um, which is just great. It shows the importance of academic integrity and also that the, uh, the appreciation of that importance here in uh, Latin America. And it's, uh, it's great to see that there are conferences uh, about academic integrity in North America, Latin America, and in Europe. Uh, even though the values we share, the core values of academic integrity are all the same, so the, um, the problems we face and maybe also the ways how we are addressing uh, these values and, uh, and related problems are different. So let me share some experience from Europe. Let me share some results we have uh, from Europe in addressing plagiarism. Um, so also, yeah, you already heard about my, my background. So the project I was uh, involved in focused on policies for plagiarism. Uh, we have been researching policies for plagiarism in higher education in 27 uh, countries of the European Union. Then the Council of Europe, uh, which uh, gathers more countries than just European Union, was interested in uh, extending this research to other countries. So we research countries in Southeast Europe, uh, and now we are finishing the project in Caucasus, Kazakhstan, and Turkey. I was also involved in the development of in-house plagiarism detection tool due to my uh, computer science background. Uh, I, la last year, I did the literature review on the technical methods of plagiarism detection, which is going to be published very soon in ACM computing surveys. And I am a founder and president of the board of the European Network for Academic Integrity, which provides resources and guidelines uh, for uh, academic uh, integrity. So let me share some of the things I have learned during my uh, during my engagement in academic integrity with you. So first, yeah, I'm sure that I don't have to convince you that plagiarism is a problem. It is, but uh, let me substantiate this with uh, some cases. We will talk about some, some cases, consequences of plagiarism. Then we will look about the causes of plagiarism, which is necessary to understand if we want to address this problem. Uh, then the addressing on three layers, on the layers of methods, tools, and uh, policies. So there will be the technical point of view, tools, and policies for academic integrity. And at the very end, I would like to introduce uh, some of the resources which we have developed within the European Network for Academic Integrity, well, not only developed, but also collected from elsewhere, which are uh, freely available for everyone which wants to benefit from them. So, in Europe, if people hear plagiarism, like for the general public, the most famous case is the case of German Minister of Defense, Karl Theodor to, uh, zu Gutenberg, um, who received her PhD degree in 2007 at the University of Bayreuth, and four years later, when he was already a minister, he was accused from plagiarism. It was during the first project I was involved in on plagiarism, so I know this case very well. It was like media was full of, uh, of this case. At the first place, he told that all these allegations are absurd, then, uh, he admitted that maybe made some errors in footnotes. But then this bar chart appeared. What you can see here in black are completely plagiarized pages. The different shades of red indicates the different extent of plagiarism on a particular page. So you can see that it was not just errors in footnote. So uh, university withdrew his doctorate, then academics called his resignation and Finally, eventually, he resigned uh, four years after, uh, sorry, four months after the first allegations. Uh, this case has also 
um, some interesting consequences. Uh, the German Chancellor wanted to support him, so she told that I appointed him as a defense minister, not as an academic assistant, like saying that, well, okay, plagiarism, maybe it was there, but it's not important. Uh, what was interesting, that public support during the scandal actually raised, which indicates how general public perceived uh, the plagiarism scandals. German Minister of Education first uh, said that, yeah, it is serious offense, it's plagiarism, um, but then she was accused from plagiarism herself uh, and was also uh, forced to resign one year later. So that was Germany. Germany is not only not the only country in Europe. In Hungary, the plagiarism scandal was uh, related to the president, who again received the doctoral dissertation, which was found to be plagiarized. 16 pages was, uh, were carbon copied. Uh, most of the pages contained some borrowed material, and only 18 pages out of 215 were original. So, um, and the process was again similar. At first, unfounded allegations. Second, this has nothing to do uh, with me uh, being a president, but <clears throat> Then the Academic Senate of the university revoked the degree and the president was forced to resign. Romania, uh, Romanian Prime Minister Victor Ponta. Uh, if you consider resignation as happy end, there is no happy end here in this case uh, because, again, dissertation, accusa accusation from plagiarism, uh, the nature revealed that more than half of the thesis consists duplicated text, which is a lot. Nature is also credible media, so like uh, defending against these accusations was quite difficult. So he didn't defend by the substance of uh, accusation uh, as such, but he influenced the process. Uh, as a prime minister, he had a lot of opportunities to do it. So. When the National Council of Attestation of University Titles, which is Romanian national body which is allowed to revoke diplomas, uh, stated that 85 pages of his, of his dissertations are entirely copied, and it uh, was pretty clear that they are going to revoke the diploma, he moved the responsibility from this body to another committee, to National Ethics Committee, uh, exchanged the, or ch changed the members of, of that committee uh, completely, and not surprisingly, National Ethics Committee said that nothing happened, and uh, Victor Ponta remained as a prime minister. And there are more cases, not only in Europe, in North America, there was a, a plagiarism in the uh, inauguration speech of Melania Trump. Uh, in Romania, the scandals continued. Minister of Research and Education, Ekaterina Andronescu. In Czechia, we also had our, uh, our own scandal last year. This uh, Czech Minister of Justice was the graduate of our university. Um, in Kazakhstan, now there is a scandal of the Vice Minister of Education, um, and there are more cases. Some people say that Russian President Vladimir Putin did not write uh, his thesis himself. There are, and there are more cases, not only uh, in Russia, yeah, in Romania, Police Academy, all the prof but not all, but a lo lot of the professors are now accused from plagiarism and self-plagiarism. So, we can see a lot of politicians, not all of them, of course, yeah, even uh, it's, it's a mi minority, but there are cases which are publicly known, and these cases, influences, uh, these cases influence what public perceive about plagiarism. There is a study from uh, Theodor Tudoriu who, uh, who examined the scandals which I just told you about, which we experienced in Europe, and examined the uh, uh, the, the support from the general public and how citizens perceive, uh, perceive these scandals. And he found out that during these scandals, citizens perceive educational system as corrupt. They uh, don't trust 
in democratic structures. Uh, um, yeah, the, it lowers the trust to, uh, in democratic structures, and he, um, he stated that plagiarism represents a direct, aggressive, and effective threat against democracy itself, which is nothing which we, should, uh, which we would uh, deserve. And okay, not everybody becomes a politician, so maybe if there are cases of plagiarism among politicians, it is serious, but it is serious problem also in academia. Um, FFP, pretty sure that you are familiar with this acronym, three cardinal sins of research misconduct, fabrication, falsification, and plagiarism. There was a study, um, the participants of World Research Integrity Conferences, fourth, uh, four research integrity conferences, were asked to rank these sins according to frequency, how do people think, how frequent do people think that these, uh, these cases of misconduct occur, and according to severity, if the, the, uh, the researchers, participants of the integrity conferences, think that these offenses are major or minor offenses against uh, research integrity. And the results are that record, uh, as for frequency, plagiarism is perceived as the most frequent uh, type of research misconduct but also the least severe case of, uh, of misconduct. So data fabrication is considered much more severe than plagiarism. And explanation for that is that plagiarism does not affect truth. That was what the author of that study, Lex Buter, uh, said at, as, uh, in his uh, keynote speech at our uh, INAI conference in, in Turkey. He, uh, even said, I don't care about plagiarism because it doesn't affect the truth. If you copy the truth, it is still the truth. If you copy what is false, it's also false. Which uh, is true, this, uh, this idea is basically correct, but plagiarism is not only about copying. A lot of plagiarists do some effort to disguise the plagiarism and to change the text they are presenting either to, uh, to hide the plagiarism or at least to show some creativity or, or create a feeling of originality. So then if you edit the copy of true, you may end up with something which is false. I have heard about the case of, uh, um, it, was a, it was a journal article about, uh, about gastric cancer, how, how the gastric cancer can be treated, and in, uh, this article was plagiarized. And every word gastric was substituted by breast. So now you got brand new article about how breast cancer can be used. Well, I'm not a woman, but anyway, I can see that breast is something different than stomach, so apparently gastric cancer cannot be cured in the same way as gastric cancer. So this is something where the truth is affected and it, it can even kill the patients. Where also plagiarism affects truth is authorship. In many countries, academics are evaluated based on the number of publications. Uh, they are promoted. They get research grants based on the number, number of publications. So funding to the institutions is based on the number of publications. And if these publications are plagiarized, so then uh, the funding, uh, fundings are, uh, funds are distributed uh, unfairly. And also meta-studies. If there is a meta-study uh, stating, for example, 10 out of 15 studies claim that uh, this is an efficient way of, uh, way of treating some, some disease, so it looks convincing, but what if six out of these 10 studies are plagiarized? 
So plagiarism, in my view, does affect truth, and that's why it is problem not only in politics, but also in science. It is also a problem in education, where students receive credit for the work they, that they have not done, so the desired learning outcomes may not have been uh, achieved, and they still get the university diploma for that, which should certify some learning outcomes, it should certify some skills, some knowledge, uh, some attitudes, but if the holders of the diploma don't have these skills, then the trust of the, uni of the university diploma is threatened. Okay, so we know that the plagiarism is a problem, so let's look at, uh, at the causes uh, of plagiarism. If we look at it like more in general, any unethical behavior, any fraud, uh, so the causes of this unethical behavior can be described by the fraud, fraud triangle. And there are three sides, yeah, it's a triangle, so there are three sides. So one side is pressure or motive. If we talk about the students, so students need to pass a course, students need to get a degree to get a better job, they feel pressure from their families and from their peers, which deserve them to get the university diploma. Then, the second side is the opportunity. For exam cheating, it can be improper vigil in vigilance. For uh, plagiarism, it can be weak detection that the university perhaps does not employ any text matching software. So uh, the, the opportunity for plagiarism uh, is there. And the third side is rationalization. So uh, those who are committing any uh, any unethical behavior, perceive it like, yeah, everybody is doing it, it's not a bad thing, and I really need it, uh, so it's maybe okay to try it, there is a, some risk-benefit assessment, okay, so I, I risk it, the, the likelihood of being caught is uh, quite low, but the benefit I can, ga I can gain is quite high. So these three sides, together, uh, influence, uh, influence all the unethical behavior, including plagiarism. We have asked teachers and students during our project. Um, so I will now show you the most common reasons which come from the uh, from our questionnaires, which we have distributed uh, to more, almost 400, uh, 4, 4, students and more than 70 teachers in 27 European Union countries. If you ask teachers what is the most common reason for student plagiarism, you get mostly these um, responses. It's easy to cut and paste from the internet, students are lazy, so they just cut and paste it from internet. They don't think plagiarism is wrong. That's why they are doing it. And also, teachers think that students think that lecturer will not care, there will be no detection, and uh, that's why they plagiarize. If you ask students, the reasons they provide are slightly different. They are run out of time. The deadline is tomorrow, no way to write her uh, assignment by their, themselves, so they plagiarize it. They are unable to cope with the workload, which is then basically the same thing, the, the, they feel the pressure, too many assignments, too many deadlines, they need to work and they have uh, a lot of obligations, are not able to cope with them, so they resort to plagiarism or other form of cheating. And then the third reason is the lack of self-confidence. They think that their own work is not good enough. So let's now put this to the context uh, of fraud triangle. So students feel pressure 
run out of time, they feel pressure, they are unable, unable to cope with the workload, and then there is kind of rationalization, so they think, okay, my, my written work would, would not be uh, good enough, so I better copy it from someone else, or even worse, ask a company to find someone who write, a, uh, write an assignment for me. And as teachers perceive as the most common reasons the opportunity, the internet is here, it's easy to cut and paste uh, from it, so there's the opportunity, uh, and then the rationalization, again, they don't think that plagiarism is wrong, lecturer will not care, yeah, it's maybe also the opportunity, but you can, you can, you can uh, see it here. For students, the most common reasons are related to pressure. For if you ask teachers, they emphasize the opportunity. And this kind of misunderstanding also is reflected in a way how plagiarism is addressed, at least in uh, Eastern Europe. At, mo at a lot of Eastern European universities, they are really focused on reducing opportunity when addressing any kind of cheating, rather than reducing the pressure, which is actually the most common cause for students. So, who to blame? There was an, uh, another interesting, uh, interesting study uh, by Peter Pavian in the Czech Republic, and yeah, he was focused not only on plagiarism, but on student cheating in general. And he did a literature review about like, what are the, the causes of, uh, of cheating behaviors, and first, the, uh, and he found out that, that first, the scientific literature or the most prevailing paradigm, paradigm was to blame the student. Yes, student are, students are bad people, they should know how to write, they should, they should work hard, but they are cheating and plagiarizing. Then there was kind of shift, and the point of view was blaming the teacher. Okay, students don't know how to write. That's the mistake of the teachers who didn't teach them properly. They uh, are not motivated and don't think that uh, the assignment is important. It's, again, the mistake of the teacher who did not motivate them. But then, uh, after the research he did in a uh, couple of uh, universities in Czech Republic, he found out that none of these uh, points of view were actually correct, and he found the systemic problem. So this is the third, uh, third point of view which we can have here, blame, uh, blame the system. So let's take a look at what effort is actually rewarded at universities. It's uh, focused on the Czech, educational system, but as far as I know, it's largely, co largely correct in a lot of uh, European countries, especially uh, in Eastern Europe. So what is actually rewarded? Academics are rewarded for publications. So number of publications, number of high quality publications, whatever high quality means, number of citations. Even I, as an academic, if I want to get promoted, so I need to have certain number of publications, certain number of citations, yeah, and then I have to supervise some students. But nobody cares about how, yeah, sometimes people care about how much I teach, but nobody cares about how good are my lectures, how good are my seminars. So, in this setting, which is focused on numbers of publications, teaching is perceived as, a, as an obstacle for publication activity. The other thing is that this pressure for publication uh, works as an incentive for academics to plagiarize, but that's another thing. So teaching is an obstacle for publication activity, should take as little time as possible, and also the university management often uh, like, uh, 
pushes the academics not to spend much time with teaching, focus on publication, this is where the university get the money from, this is how you can become associated professor, professor, this is how we can uh, get more research grants and so on and so forth. Yeah, of course, we get money also for, uh, for teaching, but it's per capita, nobody cares about the quality. And in this setting, uh, so what does it lead to? In this setting, I will cite Paibian, in the teaching learning situation that we have observed, teachers do what is easiest for them. They transmit knowledge to students who are then expected to replicate that knowledge in exams, which students manage either by memorization or copying, Either way, students are excluded from knowledge construction. Easy for teachers, they just uh, transmit the knowledge and then they can uh, make them exams as uh, multiple, choice, uh, multiple choice questions. Easy for students who either memorize it or copy it from their peers or uh, have, some, have some peer sharing sites. <clears throat> this education configuration also uh, can be seen when you, when you look at how buildings are designed, the spaces are built from this frontal instructions. There are a lot of technologies for transmitting fixed knowledge. Okay. This screen now serves like transmitter of, uh, of knowledge, but at, at many universities you will find very few resources and technologies uh, for, for interaction, for group projects and other ways of, uh, of teaching and learning than just transmission of authoritative uh, knowledge. And then students are developing sh peer uh, sharing sites to share the documents, homeworks, assignments, exam questions, whatever. And the conclusion of this study was that we cannot say that students are cheating. They don't see any point in memorizing knowledge they can find in Wikipedia or in the literature. They would appreciate more sophisticated methods, they would appreciate some knowledge construction, but if it is about memorizing, so then uh, copying and what others may perceive as cheating, is just their natural response to, uh, to dysfunctional educational system. So, we know that plagiarism is a problem. We more or less know what are the causes. So what can be, what can be now the solution? First, we need to understand the problem. Yeah, of course, if we want to solve any problem, you need to understand it. So what is the extent of the problem? What are the reasons? So we already dealt with uh, the, the reasons. Nobody knows the actual extent. We can just, uh, just conjecture from student self-reported behaviors or from some statistics from text matching softwares, but nobody uh, has an objective way how to assess the real extent of plagiarism. Um, yeah, as soon as we understand the problem, we can address the causes. We can possibly see what works elsewhere, uh, adopt some measures, adapt them to our culture, context, uh, adapt them to our institutional context, and assess the efficiency of measures. Yeah, um, and if you want to understand the problem, so first the definition. I've been talking 20 minutes now about plagiarism, um, just expecting that everybody knows what plagiarism is without uh, appropriately defining. Okay, so let's define, define the plagiarism now. Um, so it's used of ideas, content, or structures. So we have not only the text, it can be also uh, images, tables, whatever content, and also ideas or structures without appropriately acknowledging the source and what is important uh, to benefit in a setting where originality is expected. So sometimes, um, sometimes copy, just copying is a way how 
people learn, so we can't say it's plagiarism, uh, it has to be in a, uh, somewhere where originality is expected. Last week, I was in Vienna at the, the Conference of Academic Integrity, and it was organized by the Vienna uh, University of Performing, uh, uh, Performing Arts, and they were proud that their definition of plagiarism become part of the Austrian law. So, yeah, we are so good that we invented the definition that uh, they took, and uh, it was in the law. And I asked, okay, so and did, did they acknowledge the source of the definition? No, they didn't. So, so they plagiarized the definition of plagiarism, <laughs> did they? <laughs> but maybe we can argue that uh, the originality is not expected in, in the law. It's not common to acknowledge the sources in, in the law, so we can't say that this, uh, this was the case of plagiarism. <clears throat> Typology uh, of plagiarism. As I said, uh, last year I did an extensive literature review on plagiarism detection. I reviewed more, more than 250 uh, research papers on, on plagiarism. So my colleagues and I then uh, did our, our typology of plagiarism, which is based on the level of human communication. So if you have written communication, then on the lower, lowest level you have characters, and also uh, this reflects, uh, yeah, th the typology reflects this, uh, this level, so if you uh, copy something preserving the characters, so that's the most, mm, like the, the, the basic form of plagiarism, so copy-paste, the sources may be uh, possibly mentioned, which some authors co uh, call other way. Then there is um, another form, a little bit higher in our, our hierarchy, uh, syntax preserving uh, plagiarism. So it's the kind of plagiarism which preserves the structure of sentences, but maybe the words are differ different. So there are some mm, methods of technical disguise, and typical thing is su synonym substitution. So the structure sentence becomes the same, but you may use mm, slightly different words. Then is semantics, so it's a meaning of, uh, of the text. Uh, if you want to plagiarize the text, not preserving characters, not preserving the structure of the sentence, then uh, but preserving the meaning, so it's typically translation and paraphrase. So you present the same idea, same, uh, same meaning in different words and different structure. Idea preserving plagiarism is, from the technical point of view, most difficult to uh, most difficult to reveal because you don't have even the text fragment with the, with the same meaning, but you have just the idea. You have the structure, you have the template. So this structure plagiarism, template plagiarism, and idea plagiarism belongs to this category. And the last category is ghostwriting or contract cheating, as it is called in, in, uh, in academic integrity literature, uh, where someone else produces an original work for you. So it doesn't fit to any of the previous categories because it's not copy of anything which was here before. It's an original work, but it's not produced by the person who presents it as his or her own. So it's also plagiarism, but stands uh, outside of, uh, of this uh, typology as a special category. So, the next result of our, our review were these three layers. You can address uh, plagiarism. On the very bottom, there are methods. So that's where the computer scientists find uh, their area, they can uh, experiment, they can write the papers or even organize the conferences. So the typical experiment is that you have the database of thousands or tens of thousands of documents, then some of them contains plagiarism of whatever type, 
reflecting our typology, and then they find some method which is supposed to reveal most of the cases of plagiarism they have there. These methods are then expected to be employed by plagiarism detection tools, which is the second layer. Well, I don't like to, the word plagiarism detection tools. Let's, let's call them text matching softwares. But yeah, we would like to have plagiarism detection tools, uh, but we don't have them. Of course, these systems, they are not enough. At some universities, the management think that, yeah, having the tool solve the problem. So if I asked uh, some rectors, vice rectors at, uh, in Eastern Europe, like, how do you prevent plagiarism? They go, oh yeah, we have Turnitin. And that's it, that solves the problem. We know that it doesn't. You have to have some policies which tells people how to use these systems and what else besides using these systems uh, should be done to uh, address plagiarism. Um, so, how much time do we have for uh, technical stuff? Not much, so I don't want to bother you with, uh, uh, with the technical stuff much. So, in, uh, from the technical point of view, there are two basic tasks, uh, what plagiarism detection means. So, it's extrinsic plagiarism detection, which uh, focus on uh, selecting possible sources of plagiarism, finds uh, similar similarities among documents and intrinsic plagiarism detection which identifies changes of writing styles and basically find dissimilarities within one document. So to possibly uh, say that this text passage was written by someone else. Some text matching softwares are um, are now trying, trying this. I will now skip more of this technical stuff because I'm afraid it would be boring for you and let's now go to the tools. And we are a bit running out of time. So, tools. Uh, people are interested in which tools is the best. You can see logos of some of them. Yeah, Turnitin is even sponsoring this event, but as you uh, probably know, it's not the only, only text matching software. What we did in the European Network for Academic Integrity, we tested uh, these systems to be able to answer the question which tool, which system is the best for a given language, for a given type of plagiarism, uh, and considering other criteria. There were some tests even, uh, even before, but as far as we know, our testing was the largest testing which was ever done. So, yeah, last year we contacted 63 vendors, 20 systems agreed to participate. We have to exclude some of them because they were not, uh, uh, not indexing online sources. One system then withdrew because uh, after they saw the, our testing set, they decided better not to participate. So at the end, we, we tested 15, uh, 15 systems. Uh, we had our testing documents in eight European languages, well, including Spanish, which is, uh, which is uh, interesting for Latin America, uh, file formats, and we have various plagiarism types, copy-paste, we also replaced synonyms, we paraphrased the documents, we translated them, and we used various types of sources, Wikipedia, open, artic open access articles, student theses, blog articles, whatever sources which students uh, may or anybody can find uh, to plagiarize. And these are uh, our results. The greener, the better. Uh, the, and red cells indicates, uh, indicates uh, bad performance. We found uh, huge differences among languages. If it comes to the major languages like English or Spanish, there are systems which are able to perform quite well. Yeah, maybe I should say that, say that these are the averages of our evaluation. Five points is a maxim, maximum. So, uh, yeah, if you, if you see numbers around four, these are pretty good. Uh, if it is lower, 
uh, yeah, four, three, it's, it's quite good. If it is lower, it's not so good. Um, if we focus on method, on plagiarism method, you can see that the most successful, that the systems are most successful for copy-paste plagiarism. There are some systems, yeah, Turnitin, Urkund, uh, Plugscan, plagiarism check, uh, strike plagiarism, which uh, performed uh, really well for copy-paste plagiarism. When you replaced synonyms, the performance dropped. If you look at paraphrase or even translation, you can see that the performance is really bad, which is important takeaway from, uh, for educators, and also for students which can use to, uh, as a method to disguise. But for translation, you can see that the only system which found something was this Albanian national system, which is the only one uh, doing the semantic analysis, but their database is really small. So yeah, it's great they do, that they do semantic analysis, but if they don't have enough documents in their database, then uh, of course it's uh, practic uh, it's useless for the, uh, for, uh, for practical use. For translation plagiarism, this is um, how the report from the system look like. So as the systems do just the text match. So there are some accidental stri uh, strings here. The plagiarist uh, forgot to translate the image caption. And of course, list of references is quite language independent. So you can see the match. Uh, you can see the match there. Um, <clears throat> so the text match in list of references is very reliable means uh, of identifying, uh, of identifying uh, translation plagiarism. There are some similar languages, for example, Czech and Slovak, where the text match was higher. But in general, this is how the typical report look like. Uh, so you have only, uh, only the match in references. So what are the systems use, uh, useful for? What we found during our testing? They find text match from easily accessible sources which is good because the most common reason for plagiarism is uh, that people are running out of time, so then they don't have time to go to library or search for some papers which would be, uh, which would be difficult to find. So uh, it corresponds to what students do most often. They can check for accidental plagiarism. They can find the sources which you probably forgot to cite uh, and acknowledge properly. And what is important is that even low percentage can indicate a source of plagiarism, typically for that translation plagiarism. You <clears throat> see the match only in the list of references. The percentage may be low, but uh, it is plagiarism. And also, where I was disguise uh, methods like synonym replacement, paraphrase, and translation, they lower the percentage, but they don't lower the plagiarism as such. What are the drawbacks of the systems? They don't index everything, so the clear report doesn't mean that there is no plagiarism at all. Uh, it, you should always look for oddities in the text uh, and other things which may indicate. It is recommended to take some couple of random sentences and put, it, put uh, them to Google and see if Google finds something. It is easy to fool the systems by manual paraphrasing, by translation. There are some tools which uh, do automatic paraphrasing, so these, these tools can also fool the text matching softwares, and also there are methods for technical disguise, so you can replace some characters with characters from different alphabets which look the same, and the systems will not find. Some of them will warn you, but in general they don't find this. <clears throat> so, as I already said, there is nothing like plagiarism detection system. <clears throat> we have uh, systems that find text match, not plagiarism. 
under two presumptions. <clears throat> the source is uh, in their database, and the text overlap is beyond the threshold, so it's worth reporting. <clears throat> so let's look at a third layer, policies. Uh, I would recommend some great books if you are focused on plagiarism, like solely on plagiarism. It's Deborah Weber Wolf's uh, False uh, Feathers Perspective on Academic Plagiarism, and also Handbook for Academic Integrity. Tracy Bretak was a speaker here at previous conferences, so she found this great book, really thick, thick book, Handbook of Academic Integrity, and her excellent paper called Elements of Exemplary Academic Integrity Policy in Australian Higher Education could be a starting point, or I recommend it as a starting point for any uh, academic integrity policy. So let's go back to the fraud triangle, pressure, opportunity, rationalization. So we have to address all sides of this triangle. So we have to lower the opportunity, so there are def deterrent strategies like text matching software, cameras, invigilance of the exams, and so on. We have to also lower the pressure, so emphasize intrinsic motivations. Students need to know that they are learning for the knowledge and not for the diploma, and if they get that knowledge one semester later, it's not a big deal, and it's better to do their work by themselves than to resort to plagiarism or some other unethical behavior. Treat students and partners, yeah, it's possible sometime to extend the line and lower, uh, lower the mark, for example, then enforce the deadline heavily and then risk that the uh, assignments we receive from students will be plagiarized. And lower the rationalization, so from the perception that everybody is doing it, we need to move the perception to nobody is doing it, which is uh, building the culture of academic integrity. And that's where now the most of the recommendations from the scientific literature uh, are. So, as I cited, Paibian, who identified the problem in the educational system, so that's where we need to address it. We, systemic problems has to be addressing in the system, so building the culture of the academic integrity uh, affects whole system. So academic integrity is, yeah, especially in Eastern Europe, where you talk to the, uh, to the university managers, they perceive academic integrity as like not cheating, not plagiarism, not fabrication, falsification. But we know that it's, it's not like this. It's uh, that integrity doesn't mean not dishonesty, that it's a compliance with ethical and professional principles, compliance with these values which are appreciated both by individuals and institutions, uh, yeah, it's academic integrity, so it's in education, research and scholarship. So building the culture of academic integrity means <clears throat> that we build a setting where the individual group and institutions' behaviors, values, beliefs, and attitudes uh, promotes uh, and follows these values of academic integrity. Yeah, these definitions are coming from the glossary of European Network for Academic Integrity, uh, which we have developed within our problem. And this systemic effort addressing all sides of the triangle, all the stakeholders works. It's substantiated by the literature. There are studies, 10-year study from one Australian university where they introduced course on academic writing, starting using these deterrence tools, text matching software, uh, introduced criterion and standard-based assessment, and adopted a lot of like educational uh, changes. So it led to decrease of all forms of plagiarism except recycling and ghostwriting. Another study, this time only five-year study, again from Australian University, uh, describes the similar thing. Again, the bunch of uh, holistic, uh, like holistic strategy, a uh, bunch of uh, 
um, bunch of methods and measures they adopted. So they started using text matching software, both a deterrent and formative tool. Um, introduce education about academic writing and self-reported plagiarism dropped significantly. This study revealed that central role of assessment uh, is really uh, important. So general findings from these studies are that one fits all strategy is ineffective. We need multi-layered evidence-based long, longitudinal strategy, which of course requires a lot of effort. Central roles of assessment, what is assessed is really important uh, for students because it, it influences how they prepare for the exams. And we need to address both educational approaches, motivate students and remove the pressure, and deterrent strategies to prevent and detect misconduct to remove the opportunity. And of course, what we need is to uh, research the evidence and impact evaluation uh, or evaluate the uh, evaluate the impact. Yeah, never ever base on uh, base the policy on percentages. They are tricky. There have been a lot of cases where the percentage. Uh, presented by text matching software did not actually reflect the percentage uh, of plagiarism. Uh, I can talk about it more in details uh, in the afternoon's uh, workshop uh, about borderline of plagiarism. And I would also invite you to use uh, the resources of the European Network for Academic Integrity, which are available from the web page. So there are resources, there are educational materials for students and teachers which are ready to use. There is a glossary of terms for academic integrity, general guidelines for management and for, uh, for institutions, self-evaluation tools for different stakeholders. So please check the website, share your materials with us, use our materials, give us the feedback, uh, and help us to maintain this web page as a, a resource bank for everybody who is looking for any materials related to academic integrity. So, presentation about plagiarism, I can't forget to, uh, to uh, mention the sources. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay. Muy bien, en este momento daremos inicio a la sesión de preguntas y respuestas. Eh, nuestro personal de apoyo se encuentra en los pasillos con los micrófonos por si alguien tiene alguna pregunta, ellos se acercan a ustedes. Les pediríamos levantar la mano para que puedan ubicarlos más rápido, por favor. Entonces, ¿alguien tiene una pregunta? Acá al frente. A ver, una pregunta nada más así. Si yo escribo algo, publico algo, y después ese mismo artículo yo lo uso en otra cuestión donde yo tengo que, que exponer, ¿no, ¿eso no es un plagio porque fue creado por mí o si sí hay plagio? Um, thank you for that question. It uh, reflects very important point uh, of self-plagiarism. That's why the definition I presented did not contain anything about other people. It was about other sources. So, of course, if you are doing some research, you are building your research also uh, not only what other, people's, uh, what other people did, but also what you did before. And if you use something from your previous studies, your previous papers, you should always acknowledge it. So the basic rule is that you should treat your previous papers as any other sources. Yeah. Of course, it's a good thing to build on your, uh, on your previous results, but you have to acknowledge them. Yeah, that's the problem, for example, currently in, in Romania, uh, there, there are professors which uh, have problems, and, and these problems, these accusations are mostly on self-plagiarism, that they recycled the same publications several times, and it was counted several times, and even though it is their own work, it's just one work, 
not, uh, uh, so, it, so it can can be recycled. And even if you don't recycle whole paper, you take just, um, let's say, some methodology, uh, you should acknowledge that. Do you know if there's a specific age in which kids start copying or is because in high school they claim they're not mature enough to know what's going on, what they did was wrong? Um, well, I can't say that there is a, any, any specific age. What uh, we now uh, want, to, want to pursue within the Council of Europe and that uh, pan-European platform for ethics, transparency and integrity in education, which is there to provide recommendations for member states. So one of the core elements is early start. So it's late to start at the at the university of course younger students uh, may struggle with academic writing but it's uh, completely okay at secondary schools it might be too early to start with academic writing at basic schools maybe but the education about originality and about um, uh, like which, which is emphasizing that the importance of their own work should start already in kindergarten. Because there are, there are some cases, maybe you are following the ICAI blog, where Zina Reza Khan from, uh, from Dubai recently shared uh, a nice story from basic school, where the, the pupils were given the task which was completely beyond their abilities. They uh, were asked to create a desert diorama, so some yeah, kind of three-dimensional uh, image. And it was obvious that the kids were not, not able to do that. And the teacher somehow expected that parents will help with, uh, will help their kids, but then the kids presented everything as my diorama, this was my work, even though it was obvious that it was work of the, of the parents. And this is wrong, of course, because it, the students, the pupils, get used to outsourcing and presenting it as their own work. So, yeah, of course, the tasks that uh, kids, pupils, students are given should reflect their abilities. So it's up to the educators to judge when, when to start with, uh, with academic writing and how, uh, how precise they, they, they should be. But the education about the originality and about the appreciation of their own work should start as early as possible. Soy maestro, acá estoy, sí. Soy actualmente maestro de la Facultad de Filosofía y Letras de, una, de la Universidad de Sinaloa. Otro de los fenómenos al que nos estamos enfrentando precisamente con el plagio y con todas estas situaciones eh, en el posgrado de nuestra universidad, bueno, de algunas facultades hemos detectado profesores en posgrado que toman prácticamente productos textuales de sus alumnos, ¿sí?, Y efectivamente ha sido muy complejo, uno, poder demostrar y tener evidencias, en algunos casos los propios alumnos temerosos de, de denunciar a sus propios maestros, en algunos casos que algunos de estos profesores precisamente pertenecen al Sistema Nacional de Investigadores, por ejemplo, o a estructuras de esta naturaleza, en donde, como mencionaba usted hace un momento, la presión por la publicación es muy fuerte. ¿sí? Eh, desgraciadamente... Eh, no hemos logrado, en algunos casos, pues ante las denuncias específicas, que han sido muy pocas, en verdad, de los alumnos, estas las hemos sabido de manera, este, pues no explícita, ¿sí? En algunos de estos casos los hemos llevado a los consejos universitarios propiamente para, para hacer la denuncia, pero requerimos obviamente de todas las evidencias y de todos los elementos. En este caso, entiendo que este es un fenómeno 
eh, también importante que se está dando, no únicamente con los alumnos, con los alumnos entiendo que estamos procurando generar otras culturas de integridad, ciertamente, pero este elemento es un elemento en contra que, que desgraciadamente también estamos enfrentando. Un, ustedes en este caso, o en la experiencia que ustedes tienen, ¿cómo están enfrentando estas situaciones en lo particular? Um, well, these situations are really common and sometimes it's even difficult to really, really distinguish uh, um, what, uh, the border of unethical behavior. Because if it is something, a, a student project, the diploma thesis, which is supervised by the teacher, and then there is a publication, not, not only the student diploma thesis, but uh, the scientific paper coming out of, out of the, this experiment. So it is difficult to, difficult to say it should be the student, uh, uh, the for, first author, or the second author, or if the student just write the diploma thesis and then leaves the school, but teacher wants to publish it. Uh, so this is something which should be addressed at the institutional policy at first to avoid any uh, misunderstandings and stuff like that. Uh, from my point of view, the student should be always mentioned as the author or either first author or co-author of, uh, of that paper. And if it, is, if it is not like that, then it's uh, up to the ethical committee or whatever, body, uh, whatever body, uh, relevant body is uh, in their institution. I understand that for some, yeah, some professors are really powerful and can influence uh, these bodies, and then it's up to the maturity of the culture of academic integrity at that institution and how members of that committees are able to face the pressure from, uh, from that professor. But unfortunately, I'm not able to give you any easy recipe how to solve these situations. I have a question uh, over here. Um, well, there, there. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, okay. <laughs> um, well, first of all, uh, two things I want to say. First one is a comment. I believe that what you're doing is a very important task. It's a very challenging task because we as humans tend to imitate, we tend to copy, and the problem here, and that's what, that goes to my second question to clarify. The problem is not using the stuff or, or, or uh, taking as part of your research, but citing where it comes from. And uh, uh, one of the things that we see in middle school and high school, we work, I uh, have been an advisor for Model United Nations debates, and it's a lot of research to write their position papers. And one of the things that I tell my students is that you have to, you cannot create everything because it's based on previous research. So you have to analyze the information, write your paragraphs, finally you come to your own solution, and sometimes I tell them, you don't have to create a solution, sometimes you can take an idea, improve it, or implement it. If it's working in some countries, try to bring it uh, worldwide. But it is very important to cite every source of information. So the fact that the student takes this information from many different sites, uh, writes it down, but gives the credit to the people. Is this the right thing to do? That's my question. <clears throat> Well, of course, of course, if you take something from other people, you have to always uh, give that credit uh, to that people, uh, except if it is common knowledge, then uh, of course you don't, you, don't have to, uh, you don't have to cite it. Um, the thing is that students are very often afraid of committing uh, plagiarism because they are, they are even afraid of the task they are given. Uh, it seems for them to be, to be huge and now they are expected to come out with some, something uh, original. So we have to keep explaining them that uh, it doesn't have to be entirely original, that you can take other methods, uh, ideas from others and just uh, use them in the context they have. But of course, they have to clearly take the notes what, uh, what other sources are using and uh, acknowledge, uh, acknowledge the source. If they, are, if they are not sure, it's better to give the citation to acknowledge the source than to uh, risk unintentional plagiarism. I'm not really sure if I understood correctly your question and if I answered it. <laughs> okay. 
Muy bien. Agradecemos al doctor Foltinek por su conferencia e invitamos a Jan Guerrero, director del Centro de Integridad de la Universidad de Monterrey, pase al escenario para hacer entrega de un reconocimiento como muestra de agradecimiento por su participación en el séptimo Congreso de Integridad Académica. Y les pedimos un aplauso, por favor, para todos. Doctor. Muchas felicidades. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Posing for the photo. Gracias, thank you. Antes de continuar, queremos recordarles que quienes no se han registrado todavía pueden pasar al lobby afuera del teatro para realizar su proceso de registro y recoger su gafete, por favor. Ahora, siguiendo con el programa de la mañana, es un honor presentar a Amanda McKenzie de la Universidad de Waterloo. Actualmente es directora de aseguramiento de la calidad e integridad académica. A su vez, se ha desempeñado como presidenta del Consejo de Integridad Académica de Ontario, AICO, de 2014 a 2017. Es cofundadora y facilitadora del Consorcio Canadiense del Centro Internacional para la Integridad Académica, ICAI. Fue miembro del Comité de Transición de este centro del año 2016 al 2018 y actualmente es parte de su junta directiva. Ha dirigido el Día del Consorcio Canadiense ICAI desde 2014 y ha participado como conferencista en múltiples congresos tales como el Congreso Anual del Centro Internacional para la Integridad Académica, la Conferencia Inaugural del ICAI del Mediterráneo en Atenas, Grecia, así como la Conferencia Europe and Beyond sobre el plagio internacional llevada a cabo en República Checa. En 2016 viajó a la India para explorar la integridad académica en varias universidades de todo el país. Amanda McKenzie fue líder de contenido de la aplicación móvil de integridad académica financiada por eCampus Ontario Integrity Matters. También fue publicada en The Canadian Journal para la beca de enseñanza y aprendizaje titulada Uso de Turnitin en una universidad canadiense en el año 2018. Además, ella es parte de un comité provisional y un equipo de investigación nacional que explora el tema del contract cheating. Amanda McKenzie nos presentará la conferencia titulada La experiencia en la Universidad de Waterloo, Integrity Matters, The App. Recibámosla con un fuerte aplauso. Thank you. What a great group of people. I'm so pleased and honored to be able to be invited to share a little bit more about the culture of academic integrity at the University of Waterloo. So I'd really like to thank the University of Monterey for the pleasure to join them today and for the great hospitality that they've shown myself and all the other speakers. So thank you. Um, as Tomas really was uh, touching on in his presentation was the importance of a culture of integrity and academic integrity. So that's really what I'm going to speak to you about today, about the experience that we had at the University of Waterloo and the ways that we've tried to put in place to build that culture on our campus. So uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because obviously uh, you've all seen these values, I hope, and I was really pleased to see in the opening introduction that these values were mentioned. Sometimes with these talks, it's always nice to have a little bit of interaction. So I'm wondering, even though I can't see everyone, have you seen, is everyone familiar with these values? Do they resonate? Yes? Okay, that's great. That was a pretty good show of hands. So that tells me that um, we're all kind of operating from a general same definition of academic integrity. And of course, it's these behaviors and values that uh, our values and characteristics that guide our behavior. So these are the things that we want to emulate in our, not only our academic life, but also our personal life. So why does it matter as a higher educational institution? One thing that I learned this morning, which I think was really, really interesting, was um, the high school students that are attached to your university. That is very unique. I haven't seen that in a Canadian or uh, an American um, university setting before. And I think that really gives you an opportunity to acculturate your students from a very young age before they come into a university setting. So in many areas, we find that there's a huge gap between what high school students know and expect um, as they enter into higher education at college or university. So 
This is one of the things. We play a key role uh, as people working in higher education as instructors and as staff and administrators to help students really embrace these values and learn how they can um, live with them as well. Okay, so first at Waterloo, I just want to say that it's not all about students for us. Um, when I took the position about six years ago, managing Office of Academic Integrity, I knew coming in that it, it would be a, a system that would be doomed to not succeed as well as it could unless we had everyone on board. So with that in mind, we can't just focus on students. We really need to focus on everybody having a role, and we all do have a role to play. So. Our um, integrity uh, initiatives at our university focus on uh, not only students, but faculty and staff as well. So we have a tagline that says, work, study, play with integrity. And I really love that. I didn't come up with it. I wish I did, because I really like that motto. Um, but it applies to everyone on our campus. So our office targets all those target groups. And the primary way that we do that is we have a lot of promotional campaigns. So uh, I think a lot in academic integrity has to come back to communication and awareness. And the more we talk about it, the more comfortable we become with things, and uh, the more we know. So for our communication and awareness at our institution, we use a lot of promotional campaigns, marketing. So we use posters, videos, um, and we promote what resources we have on campus. I'm not sure if your experience is the same here, but we find that a lot of students just don't know what is available to them on campus. They don't know where they can go for help. And we know if they don't uh, have some options or supports that they feel they can reach out to, that's when they typically might make a poor decision and get into um, engaging in academic misconduct. We also do uh, promotional giveaways, so we have a lot of giveaway items, and I saw as I came in today there was lots of giveaway items, so I think the University of Monterey is also doing a very good job with branding and getting the communication out there to promote um, academic integrity to all the people on your community campus. So these are just a few of the different um, uh, conduits, I guess I'll say, that we use to inform and make people more aware of academic integrity on our campus. In the top corner there, you'll see um, there's some post-it notes, some buttons, and the, uh, the long horizontal one is actually, it was first put out as a magnetic bookmark, and we've also put it out as a window cling. So um, the window cling thought was we have a lot of our students that come in and they, in first year, have to stay in our residences, and we have about 6,000 of them that come. So that's a, that's a target audience that I really want to make sure that we had some messaging to. So one year I had all these window clings given to all the students in the residence with the hopes that they would put it on their windows or maybe the mirror in their room just to keep it top of mind. And again, that work, study, play with integrity, what does that mean? Also for incoming students at our university, we again have about 6,000 new undergraduates that come in our fall term. Each of them receives the post-it notes, so they get an orientation bag full of all sorts of different giveaways and um, little goodies and things. And the post-it notes I thought were, were pretty good because I remember as a grad student, I didn't have post-it notes. And I remember these have these nice little flags in there. So when I did have post-it notes, so they were the big yellow ones. And I used to rip those into strips and try and use them as flags. So my, the method to my madness with post-it notes was if we give them this kind of a little um, uh, item that they might not buy for themselves, maybe students will keep it rather than have something like a flyer or something else that they might just toss away. So, the post-it notes, again, go out to all our new students, undergraduate, and to our graduate students as well. So we have about three, uh, well, actually, sorry, about 1,600 of those that come in in our fall term. Uh, so we're hopefully getting the messaging out early. Uh, that's one of the key things, is that when students come to campus, we really want to make sure that they have this information and they're well prepared for their studies as they get going. Two of the other things that we have on this slide are posters. Uh, the first one that I came up with was the, um, uh, well, actually, the first one I came up with was the bottom one. Does anyone recognize that yellow thing? Raise your hand if you actually know what that is. OK, so some of you. So obviously, when I created this, I wasn't targeting the younger millennial or younger generation, because this is a Walkman. So this is how people like myself and older used to listen to music before there was MP3 files. So this was really a targeted ad, not just towards students, but to faculty and staff who would understand this and also get it. 
So um, I developed this poster and I gave it to our folks in our student success office that had a lot of students employed for them. And I said, what do you think of this poster? Do you think it's going to resonate? Will, will students understand it? And I thought, well, maybe they won't get the, the yellow Walkman thing. Well, they actually came back and said, well, what if they don't know what that word integrity means? And I'm like, right, good point. So I had to back up a bit, and that's when I created the top poster. So what is integrity? Let's tell them what the values are that we that we're talking about that make up this term. So um, both posters are used on campus. I use the top um, one uh, with the values that goes out early on in the term. So there is sort of like the foundation of what the values are. And then the second one with the Walkman comes out later on, just as that reiteration that, you know, we talk about integrity, your instructor might talk about it early in orientation or at the beginning of your course, but that doesn't mean it, it just goes away. We don't forget about it. We always want to keep it top of mind. So integrity is always in. It's always something that we want to keep role modeling and living in our daily lives. One of the other pieces that we've done on campus, which is kind of cool, is this spray paint of, uh, it's a chalk stencil. So it is actually quite large. It's probably about almost five by five. And we strategically paint this with chalk paint in different areas of our campus that get a lot, a lot of high walking traffic. So it's a great way, again, not to just target students, but anyone else who's visiting our campus, the instructors and the staff, as they walk over it, again, top of mind, oh yeah, like what is that? Work, study, play with integrity. Um, I, mean, I think it all, again, goes back with the culture of um, talking about these values, keeping them top of mind, and bringing them into our, our daily routine. So this is a video that someone off stage is going to play. So you can see this is one of our campaign videos that we use uh, to promote to students. I'm Vanessa. I'm a third year rhetoric and writing student. A student of integrity is one who makes an effort to learn and is responsible for his or her own success. People often associate being a student of academic integrity with being annoyingly perfect or squeaky clean. But really, an athlete of integrity is a compliment. If somebody says, hey, that guy has integrity, it's a compliment. It should be the same in an academic setting. It's about holding yourself to a higher standard. Last summer, I was in an online French course, and between all of the summer activities, like going to the beach, tanning, I'd often forget I was even in it. So we had this online test, and I, I hadn't really studied enough. So I just really wanted to call up my French friend, Sarah, and get her to write it for me. But then I thought, the whole reason I took this class in the first place was to learn French, and I didn't want to cheat myself out of that, so I wrote it myself. It's good to act with integrity. By not cutting corners, you're that much closer to self-actualization, being the smartest, most in shape, best version of yourself. of a series of videos that we had in some of our marketing campaigns. Our first campaign really focused on students, so this one was a student talking about her academics. We also had a student on the soccer team talk about her experience being a team player and having integrity with that team. There was also one for a co-op student. So uh, the University of Waterloo is very well known for its cooperative education program. And what that is is that students come and do one academic term, and then they are hired out into the workplace to work the next term to get some um, employment skills. And that's been a really successful model. So every term, the University of Waterloo actually finds jobs for about 6,000 students that, that travel in and out. So it is a, a phenomenal working machine, but it also, I think, again, is a nice way to highlight for students that it's not just in your academics that you're going to um, be using the values of integrity. When you go you know, off campus into the workplace and later on in your life, these are the characteristics that you should be emulating. OK, one of the other things is you might think, of, well, what do you do for staff? What are those things that, that you actually um, talk to staff about? What would staff come and do? And I'll clarify what staff incorporates in our, um, our culture. So I've learned that in the United Kingdom and in Australia, in higher education, staff includes faculty or instructors. So in our North American system, um, and depending where you go, staff just means 
staff, so the people that don't teach, let's say. So I think faculty members are usually a little bit more well-informed about what academic integrity is because they've had their own experiences. But how do we inform staff and get them in tune with what integrity is? So when I first started in my position, again, this was one of the little pet projects that I thought, I really want to do that. I think we really need to make this a group effort. So um, you'll see here that uh, it's a core workshop that we've developed. It's called Integrity Matters. And I'm pleased to say at my university that um, even though we piloted it many years ago, uh, the university recognized that this is one of the four courses that we want all our newcoming employees and well, as well as our existing employees to take because it's a great foundational uh, perspective to put them into uh, the mind frame, the acculturation of what does Waterloo expect? not only about the values, but also its values exploration. How often do we actually sit down and talk about what's important to us as our values as a human being outside of our workplace as well? So it's very exploratory. Um, it's been a great tool, I think, to bring people in line, not in line, but I think open up their awareness about, oh yeah, what do I really value? And if I value it in an academic setting, am I also valuing it when I'm at home? One of the co-facilitators of this workshop is in our training department and does staff training. And she uses the example that as a, as a facilitator and staff trainer, I really promote active listening. It's really important to make sure that I'm listening to people, that they're feeling that they're heard. Um, and her living in alignment piece was, am I using this value outside of work? And her example was, she gets home from work, she gets in the door, she's got younger children. And you know, uh, one of the younger children comes up and says, mom, mom, you know, I really want to tell you something. And she's like, no, not right now. You know, I'm busy, I need to make dinner or do something else. And it was that realization that, you know, if I really want to say that I value listening at work, I really should be doing the same thing at home. So those are some of the things that we touch on in this special workshop. And I'm proud to say that we've had over 500 people at our university that have done it. And those numbers are back from 2018, so there'll be even more uh, now. So we offer this as a three-hour workshop, and it's run about two or three times a term. And someone from the Office of Academic Integrity actually co-facilitates that, again, with someone from our training department. So a very unique offering and something that I think is um, a great way to make sure that the messaging is threaded throughout your whole campus. So again, not just targeting students, not just targeting faculty, but some other groups that might not be captured in some of our messaging. One of the other tools that we often promote, um, because being a small office of academic integrity, there's myself and I have one full-time staff member. I was actually lucky to finally get a full-time staff member. For many years, it was just myself, and I only had 50% of my role that was actually academic integrity. So there were some different ways that we thought, how can we leverage and get our information out there into the hands of our campus community being so small? So our university website was one of those tools that we really tried to build in as a resource or a repository that students and faculty and staff can find some answers. So on this website, we specifically parsed out three sections. Um, instructors and teaching assistants, and we recently added teaching assistants because we realized that there wasn't enough tools out there that they could really readily access and find that were applicable to them. And of course, they are a key um, uh, person who's face-to-face -face with students, sometimes maybe face-to-face -face with those students more than the instructor, him or herself. So they are a key target group that needs not only to know what academic integrity is, but also supports for them, who they can reach out to when they have issues. So we have built in a section that gives them supports and resources on our website. We also have a student section, which um, I'll pull up the slide that will show you what's detailed under the student section, but again, very resource focused, trying to make sure that students can um, readily identify, okay, I'm feeling stressed. Uh, so what, what's out there on campus that I can reach out to that would be a support for me? So we have listed those things for them. So hopefully, if they are in need um, from the pressure and different things that Tomas mentioned in the fraud triangle, that they know where they can go to try and find some help and some support. And the other piece is staff, uh, which is mostly pointing to our workshop and, and just reminding staff that they too have a role um, to play in promoting and building integrity on campus. 
So this is our student um, web page. And as you can see, I mentioned we really broke it down into different chunks that we hoped would resonate with students. So when students come to the site, we wanted to make sure that it was readily apparent to them where they could find information on different things. So we know, number one, students aren't always sure about group work. Do, do you have issues with students with working too much together here? Do you find that students aren't really sure where to draw the line between independent work and group work? Yeah, it's a challenge, right? So um, we've actually recently rewritten our um, part of our policy and our guidelines about that to try and clearly give students some education and awareness about where the line should be. So we talk quite clearly about what's good collaboration, what's not so great collaboration when you're working together too much, with some clear examples so they can actually um, think through how that would apply to them as a student and hopefully make them think twice about, you know, am I, am I working together too much with someone? Am I really learning the content? Because that's where group work can get kind of tricky. We've also broken it down into different areas um, of, of support, again, where students could get help for referencing and research, again, for stress and time management. Uh, again, with the fraud triangle, we could see that uh, that lack of time, organization, poor planning can be really a tipping point for students. So if they're feeling like they need some help in that area, this link will take them to a whole other page that will point them to our counseling services. Um, to our student success office, which will do tutoring. We actually have a neat little tool called an assignment planner, which will help them um, plug in some due dates of the different things that they are scheduled to complete during their term, and to try and help them work out the planning and the, and the timing and the deadlines of that so they stay on track. So some of these tools we hope will be really useful. Uh, we have also clearly kind of parsed out academic integrity from academic misconduct. Um, by a show of hands, how many people, and I'm not sure this could be a cultural difference, does um, uh, your university or your institution where you're from, do they sometimes use academic integrity to talk about the bad stuff where they've done something wrong? No, not many hands went up there. Okay, that's good. I, I'm, I'm glad to see that because I think sometimes academic integrity gets a bad rap because it gets associated with the bad stuff. So we've really tried to make a clear separation between academic integrity being the aspirational, the point and the values that we want to aspire to and adhere to compared to the academic misconduct, which is where the rules have been broken uh, in scholarship and academia. So uh, the main point about what the talk that I want to, uh, to get across is about two of the mandatory requirements that we've really started to develop on campus. Um, the mobile app will be the highlight, and that one will be uh, I'll speak to you next. But the first one is uh, our graduate academic integrity module. So back in, I think, 2013, uh, we wanted to have something that students would take as soon as they got on campus to really, again, give them some baseline information about what the academic expectations would be on our campus. So we built this into our learning management system, and it is, um, has different modules uh, that talk about different academic misconduct and best practices, and we require that all our graduate students must take this, and they must take it within their first term on campus. So about eight weeks in, we give them a reminder that, okay, you've had like almost two months to complete this, Hopefully you've done that. It only takes way less than an hour. If you know a little bit about academic integrity, probably 20 minutes, half an hour. So it is not um, a full-fledged course. It's not very onerous. It's something that can easily be completed. At that time, if graduate students don't have it completed, we put a hold in their account. So that means they cannot pre-register to start into the next term and register and enroll in their courses. They cannot do anything until they complete this module. And that was very purposeful. Um, at our institution, a lot of us have to have women's training and students need it as well for working with um, workplace hazardous materials. Uh, and we found that sometimes people will get to the point of graduation and not, not have completed that. So then they're rushing just to knock it off their transcript so they can proceed to, to graduate. And that's not the great timing for receiving that information. We wanted to make sure that students got this early on in their academic program. So that's why we put a hold on their account, because um, it wanted to be 
uh, a gentle reminder, but also something that they couldn't just skip over to make sure that they had that information. So this is just a little bit about the graduate aim. So it really does focus more on, mm, I'll say, the positive aspirations rather than the negative things uh, in some of our uh, teaching, so it's not all about here's how you broke a rule, here's not, not what not to do. So it talks about how to give credit, what good collaboration looks like, what is involved with being honest, and what does that look like in an academic setting. It also uses some real life examples, and again, it's very, very brief for students to complete. And uh, it's open to students in their first day of classes when they get into um, on campus. So unfortunately, it would be optimal to have it open and available to them in advance, but with the learning management system, um, we can only open it as of the first day of class. So we've had really high success. Um, most people comply, obviously, students, because they want to keep going in their program. They don't want to be stalled. Uh, recently, we have uh, revamped our content, so we'll be changing it and updating it. Of course, as you know, any tools you create and disseminate eventually become outdated. So we went out and we surveyed all our graduate students and talked about, well, you know, what are some of the things that you wish you had have known when you first came to campus? Uh, so our revised graduate aim will incorporate some of that material. And we're also working closely with our library uh, and the librarians to develop that. So hopefully by 2020, we'll have a refreshed graduate aim that'll be a little bit more targeted and up to date for our incoming graduate students. So the, the exciting app that I want to talk about the most is our mobile application. So as you heard me mention, part of the optimal piece would be to have students learn more about campus and integrity before they arrive. So in the graduate aim, if they can't access that information to the first day of class, it's kind of a little late. Also, when they're first coming to class, they have so many other things that are being thrown at them. You know, housing, um, how do I pay my tuition? Um, where do I eat? Where do I go to get to and from school? Um, where do I buy my books? All sorts of questions. Uh, so we didn't want to add to that pile of information. So with the application, it's available pre-arrival and students can log in and the intent is that they will do this before they arrive. Uh, we're hoping also that this will be mandatory. So uh, with our implementation period, we're hoping for fall 2020. And it's something that I've been working with our registrar's office and our um, technical um, IT people to try and implement. Being an app that you can find on Google Play or iTunes right now, uh, it, it's a little tricky when you're going to take it and adopt it and implement it in a university setting. So it's taking a little while to do it but we're taking our time because we want to roll it out properly. And also before it's implemented, we'll do a strategic communication um, uh, plan to reach out to the faculty, the staff, and the students. So this isn't gonna come as a surprise. This has been something that's been on the radar and they'll be well informed about what it is and why we're asking them to complete it. It'll also be a little bit different for undergraduates. Um, Again, not wanting to add to their pile of stress and push them towards any of those pieces of the fraud triangle. We want to make sure they have some time to incorporate this information, but not get too far along in their academic programs. So we were thinking of requiring that this is finished in their first two terms. So that would be in the first eight months of uh, school. The other piece that we have to consider with that is that we are, again, a co-op school, so many of our students actually start in the fall term, but they might be out at a workplace in the winter for the winter term. So to ask them to complete it in the fall before they go out might put a, a really a wrench in their academic plans and their work term. So we wanted to give them enough space that they would access this material, complete the module, but not get too far into second and third year without having um, done this, this content. So the mobile app is actually, it's based on the six fundamental values. So it's a bit of a unique app in that we didn't come forward and say, okay, we're gonna do a total module about plagiarism, or we're gonna do a module about fabrication or falsification. I find that these terms, I don't know about you, but I think students, they don't resonate with students. I mean, students might say, oh yeah, that plagiarism, I know I have to, I have to be aware of that, whatever that term is, right? Um, but you know, the words don't really, don't really sit well with them. So the app that we've developed and the modules 
and the mindset is to really focus on the six values and that if students can follow the six values, then they won't have any of these, or hopefully less likely, to have more problems with some of the other academic misconduct or breaking the rules that we see. So uh, there are modules. There's one on honesty. There's one on trust. There's one on respect, responsibility, and courage. And those are essentially um, the content that we follow in our, in our module. We also used uh, animated videos. If, again, any of you who have done any content and, and producing things that you're going to share with the public know that it's hard to pick who you're going to be on camera if you're choosing real life actors or actresses. You know, do you have the right mix of folks? What are they wearing? Is it gonna be outdated in two years? So we went with animated because it's a little less, um, a little easier and it dates a little, uh, takes longer to outdate, I suppose. And we also used uh, student scenarios. So we thought of things, and we did a lot of consultation when we created this app. We sat down with students, and we ran through some of the things and said, OK, does, have you experienced this? Or tell us experiences and challenges that you've had with academics and misconduct, and we'll roll that into a scenario. So again, it's not strictly, oh, uh, this student in this app copied this. There's a bit more context and decision making around uh, the scenarios that we have. They're also scaffolded, so there's kind of a section A and a section B. Section A of the module will give you a bit of information, and it gives the students um, the option, like, why would you make this choice? And then in the second half of the scenario is, now that you have a bit more information, would you make the same choice again, or what would you do? And then there's feedback for each of the choices that the user would select. Again, uh, a little, we want, didn't want something that was onerous. We wanted to make it really digestible and easy for students. So it only takes about 36 minutes or so to complete. So three to four minutes per module. And students can log in and do this whenever they want. They can start and stop. Uh, there isn't any uh, parameters that stop them um, or that make them have to go through the whole six modules at one time. It's also available to students 24-7. So again, uh, this app is right now on iTunes in Google Play, so anyone could log in and access it, and you can log in as a guest to test it. I will say if anyone does try, and I will show the addresses where you can find it, uh, we've learned that I've traveled around and spoke about this app, that sometimes in other countries it tells you it's not available. I understand there's a way to get around that, is that apparently if you say that you're from Canada, if you choose the App Store, and I guess you, in your settings you can say you're Canadian, that will give you the trigger that will open up access and you'll be able to get access to the app in um, Google Play or iTunes. It is also on the web as well. We have a web version. It's not quite as nimble as the mobile app is on a, on a phone or a tablet, but also accessible as well. So these are all things that we would hope that students would have uh, easy access to and something that they could do before they arrived. So this is what the app looks like on a phone. Um, there are uh, kind of three sponsors that created the app. I should say that we received a, a provincial grant to create this app from our government uh, in Canada. So we got $96,000, which is a great amount of money um, until you then you think about hiring a programmer to create your app. And then you realize, oh, OK, you mean for you can't do this for under $100,000. So we had to kind of change what we were going to offer, but still, I think our product was, was something that we were happy with, and um, Renison University College is one of the co-creators. Uh, they are a, a campus that's um, adjunct. We sit on the same land beside the University of Waterloo, and eCampus Ontario was the funder that provided the funds. Uh, we won this international e-learning award in 2018, and it was awarded in Greece, so we are getting some um, some good feedback on the app. And I hope that if anyone here is able to access it and go through it, that, um, that you'll provide feedback too. We're always looking to improve it. Of course, no one tool uh, will fit everybody. We've had uh, some piloting and some testing and in with the indigenous populations uh, that we have in, in our country, they said some of the choices that we had didn't quite fit. And the the premise of the app is that you could make it your own. So it's really kind of a shell. It's not branded. Again, it focuses on the six values, but it doesn't have any University of Waterloo branding in it. It doesn't talk about offices or services that are specific to the University of Waterloo. 
It talks about um, counseling services or your academic advisor or your library, all services that most higher educational institutions have. So it's easily something that could be used at another institution and we purposely made it that way because we wanted it to be widely applicable. And I'm, I'm, again, happy to see that most of you raised your hands about the six values because that means that this application would resonate um, with what you're doing as well. Now, we don't provide it in Spanish language right now, but that's not to say that we couldn't translate it. It is actually available in uh, three different languages. Um, it's in English, French, which is the second official language uh, of Canada, or in Canada, and uh, Mandarin. So we have a lot of students that come from China, specifically to our maths and sciences. So we also developed this so it was available in three languages. We do have other um, users that are thinking of translating it into other languages as well. So there is some work about getting it into Ukrainian and Russian, um, Punjabi. And again, we did have some people interested in, in translating it into Spanish. So hopefully there's some wider applicability and I think we'll see this tool grow as time goes on. Um, we're going to show an introductory video now just about the app, and unfortunately you'll have to watch me on video, so I apologize in advance. Uh, academic integrity can be defined in a number of different ways. I like to use the values that the International Center for Academic Integrity have set out, and they're really just values for integrity. So there are six um, common characteristics. So there's honesty, trust, respect, responsibility, fairness, and courage. And I think those are just really simple values that everyone has a good common understanding of. And if you can follow those, then you can follow the rules of academic integrity. I'm uh, Amanda McKenzie. I'm the Director of Quality Assurance at the University of Waterloo. I look after academic integrity and quality assurance. And my affiliation with the project is in regards to the content for academic integrity. On the grad side of things at the University of Waterloo, we have a mandatory um, learning module in our learning management system that all graduate students have to complete. And we would like something for undergraduate students as they're coming new onto campus. So this project looks at academic integrity in a different way. So most um, informational tutorials or uh, uh, learn how to videos about academic integrity when they're teaching it are very strict about what is academic integrity. And they focus on large terms like plagiarism or excessive collaboration, um, misrepresentation, unauthorization or unauthorized use of work. And I think the terminology just gets really confusing for students. This project was sort of a gift that was brought to me, so I didn't uh, know about the mobile information literacy project that both Alice and Tony were working on. Uh, Tony Tin approached me with the novel idea of um, how we could use a mobile application to promote academic integrity on campus. And I think I was sold as soon as I heard the, the concept. The app was developed in a really unique way. So again, instead of focusing on complex terminology, we looked at certain situations that students would find themselves in and then tried to break that down into some of the the thought process that a student would have in their decision making. It's very helpful, I think, because it's not just about academics, but it's about the whole experience. This app is um, com completely unique. Uh, it's one of a kind. It's uh, very forefront of um, ways to, to give this information and translate it to students. This application kind of covers all of the basics that I think students need to know. And again, it's so generic in a way that it's foundational that it applies to every student. It also takes the time that uh, professors in certain disciplines don't have to go into the basics because this covers up the basics. Instructors can take the time to really focus on, on specific things for their discipline about academic integrity that um, might not be relevant to the general student population. Site that tells people an introduction about the, the mobile app. So here are the addresses that you can find the app on um, iTunes and the Google Play Store. I think the most important one is that if you can't access that because we are um, in a different country, would be that you can find it on the web with this web address. Um, and I think actually they're going to pull it up so you can just see what the website looks like just briefly, we're not able to scroll through it, but they're just going to pull up the main page. Um, and essentially, you can do the whole app on the web as well. Uh, it's not, again, not quite portable because it is 
desktop based, so or you're on your laptop, whereas the mobile app is really for students who we know are on their phones, which was one of the main impetuses of why we made an application is that we know that students spend most of their time on their phone, so if we're going to show them something and teach them and really want to get the messaging to them in a way that they'll receive it, we'll do that through the mobile app, which is through their phones. So this is just the main kind of page, and you're able to click through and access it. So again, if you're having difficulty and you can't um, open the app or download it, I would suggest that you try the web-based version, or web-based version. Thank you. You guys are very kind. I actually meant thank you to, to the technical people who are closing the website for me. <laughs> You're still stuck with me for a few more minutes. But um, anyway, uh, I have to say, again, just really thanks to the University of Monterey for having such great technical people. I think it's pretty seamless as far as um, all the things that we have hooked up with um, the online webinar that I understand people are watching online. So hello to those folks. But also um, all the... Um, the technical things with uh, the website, the videos, the microphone, and everything. You're putting on a really great event, and I'm sure the rest of the day will be just as, as uh, spectacular as, as this morning's been. So I'm just going to show you a few screenshots of what the app looks like. So if you have it downloaded, this is what would come up to you. Now, we did test this with students on our campus. So for our students, they were able to log in using their University of Waterloo email. If you are able to download this app, though, you can click Login as a Guest, and it will allow you access to the system, and you can go through it. It just won't do any of the tracking. So there are tests, and behind the scenes, when we used it as a research pilot, we could gather the data of how well people do or did, and I'll share that with you later. But as a, an app user for the front end, you're just able to go through it and see the content, um, but it's not saving anything. So the languages, again, that it's available in. So English, French, and uh, Mandarin. And again, we did test this, uh, the different languages with different populations of uh, native language speakers in, uh, who were on our campus. I'm sure there's probably kinks in there because with any other language translation. And again, the headphone sets are wonderful. So I hope that as it's being translated into Spanish for you to understand me, uh, that it's coming across, but that's such the beauty of technology, right, that we have that. Um, so anyway, we've offered it in different languages, uh, just to make sure, again, that it's available. Some people said, well, why would you offer that in Mandarin or in a different language? If you're an English-speaking school, why would you provide it in a different um, language? And I think the important piece goes back to communication. Like, really, we want students to have this material, and if they're not quite there yet, um, and they've got this whole brand new experience in front of them, why wouldn't we provide this information to them in their native language so they can at least become well informed before they arrive on our campus? So that was our thinking there. So this is the home screen of the application. There's a few sections. So in the About section, there's an overview of the project, which just talks about the team um, and how the development came to be. Then there's a module section, which would open up and have each of our six modules. There is a quiz section, and then under the more, there are three different subsections. So we have resources, we have a little bit about the project team, and we have a glossary of terms. And again, knowing that students might not know all these big terms that we often use in, um, in the field, we made sure that we had a glossary so students could look up the term if they were unfamiliar. So here are the six modules. And uh, again, they're based on decision-making, scaffolded information, um, and scenarios that students would come across. Uh, take about four to six minutes max to complete. And so this is just one example of what you would find in module one. So this is module one, honesty. Um, the way that it's set up is there's a transcript of what is being uh, spoken in the video, and then there's a YouTube video. So in this particular uh, scenario, we have two new students, and one student says to the other, you know, basically, have you done this quiz yet? And the student said no, and uh, the other student says, well, why don't we do it together? And uh, in this case, you're not supposed to be completing this quiz together. So they uh, have a list of responses here of why this student decides, okay, yeah, We'll do it together. 
why might the student make this decision? So these are sort of the options that we have. And this student's name was Kalmajit. So why would you decide to do that quiz with him? Well, number one, maybe he has better marks than you. Maybe it's a good way to you for you to get a better mark. Also, maybe you were used to doing that in high school. Maybe it's no different. Maybe you always got together with your classmates and did some of the required courses or exams. Also, uh, maybe you'd be faster. Don't have to study. Get it over with very quickly, getting it done with someone else. Um, also, I don't know, maybe my friend just asked me to. Maybe socially, I feel, why not? This person's my friend. Maybe I feel like a bit of peer pressure to do it with them. And lastly, maybe I do it because who, who would know? Who's going to catch me and let me know or identify that I cheated? and uh, did this test with someone else. So this sort of gets students into the mind frame of thinking through all the different options. And it's not a flat out saying, oh, that's a really bad response. So there'll be, um, depending on what they pick, there'll be a response that pops up. So here's one of them. So I selected um, because no one will know that we work together. Well, is that the greatest answer? What do you think? <laughs> students might think that, right? until they get into their academics. So the explanation is, although no one might know, still, are you learning the content? Are you really um, taking responsibility for uh, that information? Uh, especially when you're asked to do it individually. So just, again, trying to walk students through some of the mindset of, of the thinking behind some of their decisions. So I said there's part A of scenario one, and then there's part two. So this is part two. Fast forward ahead, so same students, maybe they're a little bit further on in the term, come together and the student says, hey, you know, we, we did this test together last time, why don't we do it again? And the little added information now is the one student says, well, you know, I kind of heard that I think the university might be able to tell if we did it together, right? So if you knew that information, um, would you make a different decision? So. The, the options of what might you do. So now that you know that the university might be able, or the school might be able to tell that you did this, do you do it with them again? Or do you check the course outline or the course syllabus to see if that's allowed, if you're allowed to work together? Or do you ask maybe your classmate, another student? Or do you ask the instructor? So we've sort of structured the responses as a not so great answer to a good, better, best answer uh, to try and again, if they checked one, like let's say they said, I'm going to ask my classmate. Well, that's not a terrible um, idea, but what if your classmate doesn't know the information? What if they have no idea and they give you the wrong information? Then what? So we'd have an explanation for certain things, again, looking at a, a, a not so great answer to a good, better, best type answer. So we tried to stay away from hard yeses and nos because I think we're all kind of working through these things and there's different layers to our decision making. So uh, the answer that this, for example, was this case, ask your instructor. So it is, again, reinforcing and we're changing our language. So I'll tell you a little story about development. So. I was on the content side of developing all the scenarios and the different things, but not on the technical side. So when our technical team built this into the app, they automatically saw, oh, okay, well, you know, it's a quiz, so there's got to be a right answer, right? Well, not thinking and not communicating back to us that, well, no, our, our mindset is that it's a scaffolded answer, right? You might not make the best decision, and then there's some better decisions that you could make. So we're working through going it through, and this has actually been since corrected, that it just says, um, I think the best answer, and the one that we would recommend the most would be for that student to ask the instructor. Because as we know, instructors have different instructions and set of rules depending on the course, and even depending on the assignment that they're offering. So that's sort of an idea of how we set up the modules. And again, there are uh, two videos uh, in each of the six modules that students would work through different information and decision making. At the end of each module is a bit of a roll up. So at the end of the honesty one, well, what is honesty? Maybe we should just try and um, make sure that we all have a, a definition and a firm understanding of what it is. So we have the definition there and then we have some, some details about, well, 
talking to you about honesty. What's that all about? And then how would you demonstrate honesty? I think the demonstration piece is also important as well. And I think that comes with the five values too, right? Like we can talk about what honesty is, or we see the, the term honesty or trust, but how do you actually know if someone's acting with trust or honesty? So the demonstration piece for students, I think, is critical, right? For them to really put the connections together that, okay, I, I believe in honesty, but what does that look like? So that means, you know, uh, not telling a lie or making sure that I'm sharing information and that I'm being sincere. At the very end, we have a summative test, which um, you won't be able to see as a guest because it's not really logging your responses. But the test is something that when you actually implement this, and when we implement this as a requirement at Waterloo, we'll be tracking and uh, using in our own databases. And the quiz, we made it so they cannot access it until uh, they've done all the modules. So we just didn't want something that students could go, okay, I know I need to get this done, so let me just go to the quiz, I'll finish that, and then I won't pay attention to any of the content. We made sure that they had to go through each of the steps. These are just the last couple slides of the resources. So we wanted to point outwards, again, of what was available out there in case students needed more. I think that's always the piece that we need to keep working on is providing them the resources and supports. So that's built into the app, as well as the glossary of terms. We have students, and you know from different um, languages, it might not be a term that students know. Like, do you know what an invigilator is? And is that something that people from different cultures will know what an invigilator is? So we built that into the glossary so students can find it. All right, and then at the very end, when they complete it, they get a, either a PDF or an electronic badge. It's something that we were um, experimenting with, and these badges can be posted on their LinkedIn or Facebook account. Not sure if students are really keen on the badging piece, but um, it's out there. Do I have like four minutes to go through some slides just on results, do you think? No, I don't, okay. Wanted to let you know that we did test this with lots of students. We did have success, students learned more, so we're glad that the app has been able to be um, an educative tool, and I do have some results, and maybe we can have the slides available to uh, the audience after the fact. And just uh, two other things, just pointing beyond, working beyond your institution. I know that you've heard of the ICAI, and you know different speakers, the ENAI, uh, with represented from Tomas here, so I'd encourage you again to reach out to the other places uh, across the uh, world that do things and just wanted to draw lastly attention to the International Day of Action Against Contract Cheating, October 16th. Hopefully your institution signed up. We're just trying to build awareness about um, with, through the ICAI uh, to, to make students aware and get some buy-in about not participating in contract cheating. So sorry you didn't get to the rest of the data slides, but I'm happy to take some questions. Muy bien, les recordamos que nuestro personal de apoyo está en los pasillos con los micrófonos para que por favor eh, levanten la mano o se levanten y ellos se puedan acercar si tienen alguna pregunta. No, I know everyone wants everyone wants their coffee break. Okay, okay. You have a pregunta. Hi, um, I work here at the university. I, I remember you, um, and I remember this uh, app, uh, the game app. Um, it's been like two years or something. Uh, with that, what is the result that you have seen in this time uh, with the students? Over time with students, time. Yeah. Um, I would like to say that we, I would have liked to do more longitudinal research, but the funding that we had to fund the creation of the app and do the research ran out. So we actually haven't continued to pilot it with students, 
But I think what you um, highlight is that there, once we do implement it for our university, is that we will be doing some tracking to see what the longitudinal findings are. Um, we do have other institutions uh, in Canada that have adopted it as well. So Seneca College is a college in Ontario, Canada, and they've taken the app and customized it, put their logo and branding on it. It's also available in Google and iTunes as well. And we do have other universities that are talking about implementing it. So once we get more up and on the road, it would be amazing just to not only track for our use and where we see it uh, making an effect with students, but also cross-comparison between different higher educational institutions. Thanks for your question. Otra pregunta? Muy bien. Entonces, agradecemos a Amanda McKenzie por su participación y le pedimos a Jan Guerrero, director del Centro de Integridad de la Universidad de Monterrey, que nos acompañe para entregar un reconocimiento por compartir con nosotros usted, tus experiencias. Muchísimas Thank gracias you. y un aplauso, por favor, para Amanda. Muy bien, ahora tendremos un breve receso y para eso los invitamos a pasar al lobby. A...